Today, I'm speaking with Larry Jordan. Larry, thank you so much for joining me today. Thank you. And I just want to give a quick bio for Larry. Larry grew up in Pennsylvania. I did as well, by the way. I was over near Philadelphia, so you're in a different part of it. Um, but he now lives in Texas. He studied public administration at Syracuse University, and he studied city planning at the University of Virginia. Those are interesting topics to go into. Uh, he was raised Catholic, which we'll get into shortly. And he read 1,000 books, probably more, I'm guessing, but at least 1,000 books in preparation to write his book, The Way, Meaningful Spirituality for a Modern World, which he published in 2023. His website is LarryJordanAuthor.com. I'll have the links for his website and his, and his book on Amazon beneath this video, so please do check them out. And Larry, if you could tell us more about yourself and also tell us your hobbies or anything fun about yourself as well. Yeah, sure. Um, thanks, Tim. I'm, I've really been looking forward to this and I'm sure we're going to have a great conversation. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm 65. I retired about a dozen years ago. I'll get, I'll get into that a little bit. Um, my wife and I have traveled all over the world. We've been on seven continents, uh, even Antarctica. Not too many people can say that. And um, we enjoy uh, uh, volunteering and playing with our grandsons. We have three grandsons, you know, they're still at the age where I'm their favorite person. I can tell the oldest one, he's sort of thinking, eh, he's not all that, you know, but uh, <laughs> it's it's been that, that's something that's just brought joy to our lives. And we're, we're outdoor yeah. people who like to hike and that kind of thing. So, Yeah, I've got small kids as well. You probably know four little ones and it's yeah. having small children in your life is just such a wonderful blessing. It really is. Absolutely. And if you could tell us, uh, tell us something quirky about yourself, a hobby or something uh something really off the off the beaten path i did stand up comedy on a cruise ship one time and um wow it that's pretty, cool yeah, it, was, it was very cool is that something you, you would consider doing as a kind of a part-time gig at some point no I, i'm looking to do fewer things not more things <laughs> <laughs> i hear you i'm i'm kind of in the same boat but i'm that i'm in that ramp it up uh double time mode of life right now but i hear you yeah. You need that definitely all we need that balance of work but also rest well i know we're of course we've got so much to talk about we're going to start if we could by hearing about your story how you grew up a little bit and then we'll slowly uh, migrate towards your book and what what caused you to write it and what's actually in it what people can expect as they pick up a copy but if you could start us off with your childhood where did you start in terms of your relationship with uh christianity and catholicism yeah well um i, I was a cradle catholic went to mass you know um, every week I uh, went to confession every month, went to Catholic school a little bit, served as an altar boy. Uh, di didn't really uh, question too awful much. You know, some things seemed unusual to me, but, you know, I was really sort of preoccupied in my life. You know, people kind of joke about Catholics. They don't really read the Bible. They don't. <laughs> Catholicism is, it's sort of like Judaism. There are, I, I, people have said there are secular Catholics. There are people say, are you still a Catholic? I say, I don't know. Are you still Irish? You know, it's, it's it's pretty deep and there's lots of um there's lots of guilt and obedience and hesitation to question authority and that kind of thing which you know ultimately became a problem for me so i, I went into um i went into the investment banking business and if you were a city or a county or a state agency and you wanted to borrow money you'd call me up and i you know i did lots of uh, schools and streets and sewers, but man, I did airports and convention centers and uh, sports stadiums and toll roads and power plants and hospitals. And, and it was really a fascinating business. I learned something every day. It was very transactional. It, it was a lot of stress and a lot of travel. And, you know, you might one day make a million dollar mistake that you really didn't have a way to fix. And there were guys in the business that said, well, it's we're in big business. We're going to make big mistakes. And I was never that casual. I mean, a million dollar mistake is a huge, is a huge mistake. And my clients were my friends and I really was trying to do right by them. So uh, mm. anyway, um, that's like a lot of responsibility in that kind of job. That's, that's amazing. I had the only thing that I've ever had that came close to that was uh, I worked for a brokerage firm for right. eight years and yeah. I worked for the first four years as just a stockbroker, helping people understand how to trade. But then I worked in their fraud department for the last four years. And at first, you have to get everything you do approved in terms of like we would review big wire transfers out. But at the very end, I got high enough in my clearance, so to speak, that I could I could literally approve million dollar wires myself. And that was like, you know, when you when you've got your finger on the mouse to click go, you're like <laughs> your heart's palpitating a little bit like, am I, am I sure that this is not fraud? And, you know, you, you, you figure out how to make sure you're sure. But it's crazy the responsibility that you uh, have. But anyway. Yeah, exactly. 
Um, so, so I get to be about 50 years old and I, I had, I had some midlife stuff, not a crisis, but you know, I did some reevaluation. I was doing a, a lot of, um, reading. Uh, I was wondering what I was going to do with the, you know, the next half of my life or the next week of my life or whatever I have left. And in 2001, you know, the planes, um, hit the towers, 9-11 and, um, I just became interested in that. I thought, what kind of religion, you know, sends airplanes into buildings? And it took me about five minutes to figure out no religion does that. You know, it's that's an anomaly. I really became intrigued by Islam, um, particularly the mystics of Islam. And I thought, well, why aren't there any Christian mystics? Of course, there are, you know, we just don't hear about. Them. And as I'm studying Islam, I'm thinking, you know, I really don't know that much about my own religion. And, you know, when I retire, I might want to be a deacon in the church or something. So I set out to find out as much as I could about Christianity. A thousand books sounds like a lot. It's a book a week for 20 years. It's it's not that it's not as much as it sounds, <laughs> but but it is a lot of books. The book is written from a big picture standpoint. It's not, you know, it's not a particularly deep book, but it's a pretty wide book. And to write a wide book, you know, you have to read a bunch of deep books. So anyway, I found you know, my my education was kind of utilitarian. Uh, was utilitarian. It was designed to make me employable. It wasn't designed to make me think. Uh, so, I really was lacking in all the philosophy and all this kind of stuff. So, when you say I'm going to learn about the last two thousand years of religion, you end up learning about history and philosophy and theology and psychology and biology and chemistry and physics. And um, when I started, I thought, well, this this will be uh, good. Um, Christianity has been around for 2000 years. Surely if there was any um, problems with it, you know, they would have surfaced by now. It's there's a book, you know, um, it's his, it's more historical than many religions. So I'll probably just confirm some things I already know. And I really discovered that it's not really as absolute or authentic or original or rational or unchanging or universal as I thought. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, the first thing to fall away was like um, talking snakes and global floods and physical resurrections and virgin births. And if you really look at those accounts, they're, they come from other places. They're influenced by other traditions. They're, they're reported differently in the Gospels. If you read the first Gospel, no virgin birth, no physical resurrection. Somebody says, who are you? Are you, you know, are you the Messiah? He says, don't tell anybody. Well, by the fourth gospel, you know, 80 years later, I'm the way, the truth, and the life, the only way the Father's through me, a bunch of long uh, stories that aren't repeated anywhere else. So, so I, going from the beginning and carrying forward, I started realizing, gosh, you know, all this stuff that I thought started at the beginning, I thought Jesus whispered to the first pope, and the first pope whispered to the second pope, and you know we got the message, you know, loud and clear. It really, it really wasn't that way at all. It was a very clunky process, very human, very flawed. Can I ask a question about what you just said? The the resurrection you mentioned that's obviously the cornerstone of the story in many ways. The death, uh, burial, and resurrection of Christ, especially with atonement theory, that the yeah. the death was a violent death on our behalf, and that it had to be. <laughs> the the blood of a spotless lamb and jesus ultimately was the lamb of god to take away the sin of the world so when you look at the resurrection especially from an evangelical protestant perspective the the death and, and resurrection of christ is is where we find our sins forgiven and paid for where we find our hope for eternal life was was that the kind of messaging you would get in the catholic church in terms of how to be right with god or like i know those things with confirmation and sacraments how did you find your spot as you were growing up and getting through the, the different levels of, of understanding. How did you get to a point where you felt like as a Catholic, you were in a right relationship with God and eternity? Yeah. Um, Catholics think, uh, Catholics really think it's unusual to announce that Jesus is your Lord and Savior and to, and to think that there's any validity to that. Um, you know, we were sort of taught, well, you know, um, all this stuff happened. Uh, the church got it right. I, I heard the other day a, a Catholic priest kind of winked and said to somebody, well, 
well, you can live your life your way and we'll live our lives his way. It, it sounds cute and funny. It, it, it's really not. It's really a passive aggressive, you know, but there was a, there was a lot of thought in Catholicism like, man, um, we have we have the original religion. I don't believe that either. We have the original religion and these other guys, you know, they just decide to make stuff up and change stuff on their own. And they thought they were smarter than 1500 years or 2000 years of history. What we thought we need to do to get right, and I, I'm sure there's Catholics that would dispute this, but my idea was, you know, there are sacraments. You have an obligation to go to Mass every week. There are sacraments. You have an obligation to go to confession frequently. You certainly don't want to get hit by a train if you've just killed somebody and not gone to confession. But if you kill somebody on Friday, I'm, I'm really exaggerating here, but I'm, I'm making a point. I'm not too far off. If I kill somebody on Friday... I go to confession on Saturday. I go to mass on Sunday. I'm okay when I get hit by the train on Monday. Now, to me, uh, Protestantism doesn't isn't much different than that. It's like, well, if I if I walk down an aisle when I was 12, I said I was committed to Jesus. Uh, I get hit by a train. I'm okay, even if I kill somebody. I, I think there's problems. I think there's problems with both. I, when I have this conversation, I say, you know, it's too bad that Jesus didn't really answer the question, "What do you need to be saved?" facetious. You know, actually he did. You know, he was asked in the rich young man, what do you need to be to be saved? And he said, well, you follow the law. Well, that sounds kind of Jewish, but he was Jewish. You know, you'd be a good person. Well, that sounds kind of Catholic, you know, but so so be it. And the rich young man's going, huh, huh, what do I really need to do? Sell your stuff and follow me. I, I, I'm going to get to the story, but I did that. And I don't know too many people that have. And I'm blessed that I was able to do that. But, you know, when I say to people, they say, you know, have you accepted Jesus? I say, I don't know. I mean, I, I read the Bible. I quit my job and sold my house and, and followed Jesus. You, you tell me. And I, I was privileged to be able to do that. But, but I did that. And I think it's a more serious commitment than some commitments some other people have made. The rich young man haunted me when I was 50. And I thought, well, maybe I should do that. I mean, I have some financial security, you know. Um, I don't know if I have enough. And this voice in my head was saying, well, you know, the average person in the world lives on $2 a day. So I think you probably have enough. And so my wife and I kind of concluded, well, and I did a little bit of a reassessment. I, I thought to myself, well, you know, how many times have I really done something for other people? Not because I was paid to, not because that's what I was supposed to do as a father or a husband or a friend. I'm talking about help a stranger. And I don't mean incidentally, I mean in a big way. And at that time, I had lived about 20,000 days, and I could count on one hand the times that I had gone out of my way for a stranger. And I don't think that experience is so different. I, I was not a, a particularly bad guy. I was very busy. I was very preoccupied. I was very committed to my family, my friends, and my business. But I was not a particularly bad guy. But I thought, you know, here you are at 50. You have your health. You have your. You've been married for thirty years. Your kids are launched. They're adults. They're doing fine. Uh, your parents are still alive. You have financial security. You have lived a pretty lopsided life. You know, your taken hand is a lot stronger than your given hand. And and part of it was my Catholic guilt come back and saying, "Yeah, you you better fix this." Mm -hmm. So we we decided we're gonna we're gonna quit our jobs. We're going to sell our house. We moved into a 1,600 square foot condo. I drive a 2011 car. I take Social Security. I don't have a pension, but I have assets. And I draw down my assets to live. And about half of what I draw down goes to other people. Now, what, what do we do when we retire? Everything. Went to Africa for six weeks, taught school. Not as a missionary, not to evangelize, to help people. You know, then I did a uh, thousand tax returns for low and moderate income people. Then I did um, drove drove a thousand veterans to the VA for medical appointments, blind guys, people in wheelchairs, twelve hours a day of driving. Um, I worked at camps for kids with cancer and and burn you know burn victims and this kind of thing. I basically got out of my box and I realized, 
man, you know, if you live in the same neighborhood, go to the same church, kids go to the same schools, everybody looks like you and talks like you and thinks like you. It was really, it was really eye opening for me. And it, this was happening concurrently with, with all the reading I'm doing, all the thinking I'm doing. I was actually in preparation to be a deacon in the Catholic church. And a guy that I didn't know very well took me out to dinner and said, don't do it. Don't do it. The Catholic church is all about priests. You're just going to, you're going to frustrate yourself. And I was on a committee with the bishop and I got, um, I became a little disenchanted with the church's focus on, um, on priest settlements, on how much money was going to priest settlements, on how much they were doing to kind of protect money so they didn't have to make settlements. And that was really, really concerning to me. And my kids were saying to me, um, I don't understand your position on LGBTQ people. And I really had an unsupportable position. My daughter's a psychologist. And she was she was sort of firmly but gently saying, you know, what you're saying just doesn't make any sense. And so that started unwrapping some things too. Um so so oh, and, and the, the other thing I was gonna say, I, I was talking about uh faith and works, and I say, you know, what he really said was sell your house and follow me. And invariably, and this is people who say the Bible's inerrant, it's 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 clear and true in its original language, they'll say to me, well, that particular passage, I'm sure it was a mistranslation, or that particular passage, um, that was that was instruction for that one individual, not for all of us. To me, it's one of the most authentic sayings in, in the Bible. So at the, at the end of the process, I tell people, I thought I was gonna roast some weenies, I ended up burning my house down. I mean, all of a sudden, um, all this stuff I believed in comes from other traditions, only been around a few hundred years. You know, that's the that's only the way some people think of it. Some of the problem with talking about Christianity is which Christianity are you talking about? I mean, there's a billion Catholics. There's a half a billion evangelicals. There's probably a half a billion uh, mainline Christians. There's every, everybody has a everybody thinks their own Christianity is kind of normative. And sometimes you'll get in conversation with people. I say, well, what's your problem with Christianity? I say, well, I've got this issue or that issue. They say, well, I have that issue too. Well, <laughs> okay. I mean, but if, if you were going to champion, if, if you were going to criticize something I'm thinking and champion something somebody else is thinking, we, we're not going to have much of a conversation if you're going to jump on my side of it, telling me. So anyway, it was dark. And, you know, pe people say it's like, it's like um, a death you know, where you go through the stages of grieving. I went through an angry period. I used to get on the internet, pick fights with people. Not a good thing to do. Um, never, never leads to any benefit. And, um, and what got me out was um, the Eastern religions and the mystics and, and the scientists. Now the Eastern religions, mm -hmm. the first thing I realized was what, have you ever wondered why only 2% of the people in China are Christians? No. Well, it's because they have a totally different worldview. In the West, we're all about individuals. Personal responsibility, personal salvation, uh, personal relationship with God. In the East, there's people that say things like, well, what is a person? Are you a person? Do you have a soul? Do you have free will? We we here are all about oneness. You know, we're we're all about uh in the, the Buddhists would say emptiness becoming form. The Taoists would say the Tao becoming ten thousand things. You know, our our real focus is it is not the fact that you are an individual and your individual security is guaranteed, it's that you're part of a fabric. You're woven into the fabric of the universe. And, and, and I, I came to accept that way of thinking about things. The mystics, uh, that's where it kind of starts to get interesting. And, and um, I was on a podcast previously where somebody said, well, you know, in your book, you say that the mystics and the scientists are, are similar. I said, they are. You know, I, I've just about abandoned any doctrine that I ever held dear. 
I am totally about uh, evidence, and that's what the scientists are looking for, and the scientists are all concerned about the physical world, and I'm all about experience, and that's what the mystics are all about. And the mystics are either about some part of the physical world we don't understand, or they're about the metaphysical world. And, you know, um, I, I don't mean to sound woo-woo when I talk about the scientists, I'll clear it up, but you know, there are just things we don't understand. There are things like near near death experiences and past life recollections and and uh, telepathy and you know everyone almost everyone I know has a grandmother or a, or an aunt who who predicted something or she woke up and woke up screaming because something bad happened to somebody she cared about. There's just a bunch of things we don't understand. Personally, I'm really hesitant to say, well, that's supernatural. That means there's something beyond biology and chemistry and physics, because that's what they used to say about everything. You know, and the more that we learn, the less things are supernatural, the more things are natural. So I leave it at this. There is a there is a mystery. There are things that we don't understand. There seems to be a collective experience. There seems to be a lot of interrelationship. There seems to be something like mind bigger than brain, something like collective experience that's far and above individual experience. There must be a way that people can access somebody else's life or, or, or what's happening across the state. I don't know what it is, but 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 it's intriguing and I can't dismiss it. The mystics, um, there's about 30% of people that have had a mystical experience. And if you don't like the word, just think of peak experience. And that's something that psychologists, scientists, neuroscientists talk about all the time. In a peak experience, bam, um, you're transported, you're in the same place, but it's different. And instead of seeing me and you, I see a field. I don't know where my uh, hand ends and where the space around it begins. I have this sense that I have all the answers to all the questions, that I am woven into the fabric of the universe, that there's a benevolence there. And 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 it, it's such a singular experience that, you know, what you'll be having a conversation with people, go, oh, that happened to me. That happened to me. My wife did that to me. My wife said, that happened to me. <laughs> she had never told me. It happened 25 years ago. It happened in nature. She said, I didn't think it was anything spiritual. I just thought it was really a cool experience. The reason people don't think it's spiritual is because they don't see what they expect to see. They think that if they're seeing something in the natural world that they've never seen before, or if they're seeing something supernatural, well, maybe Jesus or Buddha or Krishna is going to be there. Maybe they're going to be transported to a heaven or a hell. Maybe they're going to feel this sense of separation between their selves and, and ultimate reality. You know, none of that happens. Now, I guarantee you, if a whole bunch of people had near-death experiences or peak experiences, and they all reported that they encountered Zeus, we would all be reconsidering our theology a little bit. But that's not what happens. You know, people that believe in Greek religions see Zeus. Catholics see Mary. Protestants see Jesus. Hindus see Krishna. So, so the, the, the mystical experience told me what I thought about ultimate reality is, is different than what ultimate reality really is. So mm -hmm. there's a guy that wrote a book called The Tao of Physics, and he, he talks about the similarities between Eastern mysticism, and remember the Eastern religions are all about the fabric of the universe, and quantum physics. And basically, quantum physics says that there is a fabric, that the table is not as solid as you think it is, that the air is not as empty as you think it is, that two particles that are entangled, and it's possible because of singularity that all particles were entangled, they still are entangled. Something over here can impact something over there. We are not billiard balls bouncing into each other, and we're not observers of a universe that's outside of ourselves. We're participants in something huge. And, and there's weird things that happen. You know, you fire a, a, a beam of light uh, through a device, uh, is light a particle or a wave? 
Well, it depends on whether the device is measuring particles, it'll see it, or waves, it'll see it. If you, if you um, know anything about the physics of 100 years ago, a lot of those guys were reading the, the Vedas and the Upanishads. And they were saying, you know, it's really curious that the oldest religion, the Hindu tradition, they had some kind of inkling about the way that things work. Now, I was finding in my exploration that the more I read the Bible, the more I thought, well, this is not the way that things here. You know, there was no, humanity didn't start with two people. That's not how species begin. You know, the earth was not created in uh, 6,000 years. Uh, the universe doesn't revolve around the earth. There's not a heaven above us and a hell below us. And so it's, it's, it was curious, but it, but to me, it was like, okay, look, I'm getting this everywhere I look outside of, of Western tradition. I'm getting this sense that everyone's related and everyone's connected. And to me, that's what experience reports. That's what the evidence supports. So to me, is that an aspiration? It's stronger than that. Is it a belief? It's really stronger than that. It's really a knowledge that, again, it's not we. Really, the physicists will tell you we live in a field. Everything is energy. Energy is matter. Um, matter is energy. Energy is conserved. It's not created. It's not destroyed. So, so at the end of this process, and again, this is a bunch of things. This is me getting disenchanted with the Catholic Church. It's me doing the homework and figuring out I have much, the, the Western tradition has much less credibility, but I'm saved by the Eastern religions, the mystics, and the physicists. It, it transformed me. And, you know, it's like when Martin Luther King says, um, if, if one of us hurts, all of us hurt. It transformed me to the extent that um, a few years ago, my my adult children sat me down and said, what happened? To you? I said, what, what do you mean? And I said, you know, you were this type A guy, driven, um, focused. Look at you now. I mean, you're, you're teaching school in Africa. You, you're, you know, um, you laugh more, you cry more, you have more friends, you have deeper friendships. Whatever you're doing, more people need to do. What are you doing? And I said, well, look, I, I couldn't tell you a sentence. I've read a thousand books. I've chanted to Shiva. I've rolled with the dervishes. I meditated in a zendo. I couldn't tell you a sentence. I'd have to write a book. And they both said, you have to write the book. Hmm. And I, I uh, had never intended to write a book. I had never written a book had not taken any notes to prepare for writing a book. And, um, but, you know, I thought I do need to write a book because it's important. And it's important for a couple of reasons. It's important because the way you think affects the way you live. And if you think about thing, if you think about the fabric of the universe, instead of your pixel, you know, you live a different life. The book helps people who have left Christianity to say, I don't know. I, I still worry about hell. I still worry about um, whether all that stuff that I no longer believe is actually true. The book is very gentle. And there are people that said, your book helped me to come to terms with my questions. There are other people that say, your book helped me to become a better Christian. I love both answers. I, I am not trying to convert anybody to anything. I'm not trying to deconvert anybody to anything. I don't expect to, anybody's going to be transformed, but I know some people have been touched. And people say, I've read the book two or three times. They say, I, I got your free download of an ebook and I want it on my shelf, so I bought the paperback. Or they say, I uh, bought the paperback and I liked it so much that I gave it to my adult kids. You know, I bought more of them. And so mm -hmm. it's been uh, it, it's been a really, really interesting journey uh sometimes painful but today i hope that people look at me and say well this is kind of cool this is not an angry guy this is not a guy with an axe to grind 
This is not a guy who's trying to sell me anything. And he's a retired guy. He's not even doing this to make money. Matter of fact, he's spending money. But but he's asking good questions and he's he's softening the soil a little bit. Because think about the world that we live in where people think that beliefs are more important than facts. Where did they learn that? They learned it in church. Uh, people think that uh, that they should only associate with people who have the same beliefs. Where did they learn that? They learned it in church. People think that people with the same beliefs are really, really good people, and people with different beliefs are not. You know, and maybe we should make them more like us so they can be good people too. Where did we learn that? We learned it in church. And so one of the real messages of the book is don't take any of these beliefs too seriously. I really personally care more about what I do than what I believe. But more than that, I care about what I, what or who I am than what I do. I, I feel like if I realize the oneness, if I see that I'm connected to the fabric of the universe, I, I'm going to live a, a pretty good life. I'm going to be, and it's proven out, I'm much happier, I'm, I'm much more content. I'm, I'm much more able to deal with the give and take of people that say, I don't agree with what you say. Because, you know, somebody asked me the other day, do you worry about getting trapped in a contradiction? Well, I don't really have that many beliefs, so it's not likely <laughs> that I will. The one, the one belief, and I think it's knowledge, not belief, is that everybody's related and everything's connected. And I've got the Eastern religions and the mystics and the science fall back on. If somebody doesn't want to listen to that or they don't believe that or they think, you know what, this is all horseshit, excuse me, you know, it's, I'm I'm here. I'm here for a short time. I have a family. I have friends. I have a job. There's nothing after this. So I'm I'm just going to live the the best way I can and my family can while I'm here. It's not the way I think about things, but that's okay. And if you're that guy, you'll read my book. You'll think it's interesting, but you'll say, "Well, I'm I'm not in I'm not in the same place he's in." No, that's okay. Yeah. There's so many questions and. In- Thoughts I wanted to add here, but just a few quick things, if I could jump in, and I'll give you a chance to take a sip of water or something. But number one, I, I think it's interesting how you talk about the mystics and just to share an anecdote from my life. I loved the music of a musician, an evangelical Christian musician named Michael Card. Uh, for many years, many, many people considered him the elite in terms of he was not just doing Christian music, but he was very, very faithful to the text very theologically deep. A lot of people lifted him up as as like a hero. And at that time in the Catholic Church, there was this monk named John Michael Talbot, probably heard of him, who was doing something very similar for the Catholic Church. But it was very he was very mystical. He was reading the Catholic mystics. And so he would have songs about his relationship to Christ was like, he would have these erotic stories that he was he had not written, but like mystic Catholic mystics had written Mm-hmm. about lovers coming together in, in marriage and very, very uh, highly erotic, almost to the point of like Song of Solomon stuff. Right. But yeah. celibate monks and nuns reading this stuff, and then John Michael Talbot current day is is singing songs about it. Very mystical stuff. You know, I remember one where they, they the man meets his lover on the beach and they go to a cave and, and make love all night. And it's like, it was very intense, but it was all about your relationship with God and Christ. Very different. But I remember at one point they did a, an album together called Brother to Brother, which mm-hmm. at that time for evangelicals was anathema. <laughs> but yeah. it brought into my mind the idea of, okay, maybe there is a different way to see some of this stuff. And it's fascinating that you could have people considering people from the other side of the aisle, as it were. Uh, I know it's usually re- Republicans and Democrats, but evangelical Protestants and Catholics saying we can work together on some of these ideologies. But that was that brought into my mind a lot of stuff, and I did end up reading a lot of the uh, more esoteric uh, Christians of, of yesteryear. But one thing I wanted to clarify was just the word benevolence. And I I, I interviewed uh, a couple months ago a, a lady and her her daughter who talked a lot about this that the universe as they as their faith evolved over the years it just became God is love and there's so much love in the universe and everything to them was just love and oneness. And I brought up the fact that. You know, for most of this planet, the the in terms of the species that are living, for most of this planet, life is anything but benevolent. 
that the majority of animals get torn apart uh, or swallowed whole or die of starvation. There are, for us as human animals, there are thousands of people dying a day of starvation and natural causes that are, you know, you could argue, well, we could, you know, avoid some of these if just the rich people would give their money to the medicine or to the to the food and so forth. But regardless of why it's happening, for the majority of, of human history, and for certainly even today, the majority of animal history, it is horrifically unbenevolent, unloving, it is chaotic, and it is painful, it is gruesome. And so I think even though there's a oneness there that I definitely think is is worth pursuing, I think it's important, and I'm not trying to be like Star Wars where it's like there's light versus dark and we just have to balance it. I'm not necessarily going down that path, but just to acknowledge that the oneness that that we might consider is not necessarily truly benevolent. It's not necessarily not benevolent. It's just, it's neither. It's It doesn't care. It doesn't care. Like we don't, the universe doesn't care what we experience. The universe, if you could anthropomorphize it that way, it doesn't care if your life is wonderful, if you've got money, or if you get ripped apart in a thousand pieces, it doesn't matter. The universe is is, is totally unconcerned about that in a sense. And I'm anthropomorphizing heavily there. But I think it's important to just mention that, that the the whole oneness of like, well, but it's it's love and there's it becomes syrupy and sacerdotal. It becomes this mushy. And, and I think we 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 tend to migrate that because we were used to, from that because we're used to this. God is love and God is so much love. His love is so big, we can't even comprehend it. And so when we escape the fundamentalism, but we keep the God is love part of it, it's just, well, the universe is love. For most of the human history and animal history, it's it's anything but love. It's It's actually savagery. So it's interesting trying to pull that all together. Does that make sense? Yeah, of course. This is a great, great question. And I can I can tie them together. Christian mysticism is is sort of um unique in in two ways. One is that, like you say, uh some of the mystics have have been very emotional and very erotic. Um and that comes from again the Western worldview of we're talking about a person. That's how you relate to a person. Uh, Eastern mysticism totally different, and the point I was trying to make before was that the what I would call the universal mystical mystical experience is impersonal. It's not syrupy. It's not gooey. Buddha was enlightened when he sort of contemplated ultimate reality, and he had what is what people would describe as a mystical or a peak experience, but it was not personal. The other reason that 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 Christian mysticism, which is really Catholic mysticism, is different than others, is that that it is a it's expressed as a union. And Eastern mysticism and the impersonal universal peak experience is not a union of two. It is it is a realization of one. Um, so you're not going to have an erotic experience with yourself in a in a mystical experience, nor are you going to have an erotic experience with the impersonal universe. Now, the benevolence, that is a that is one of the counterparts of, uh, it, it's one of the aspects of the mystical experience. And it just is meant to say, people that have this, people, if a Hindu says, I encountered Brahman, which is everything, or a Christian says, I encountered God, or a Buddhist says, I encountered the void, which is emptiness. They, they all are having the same experience when they report these five or six characteristics that are reported over time in many places and many traditions. I'm asking the same question you are about benevolence. I really, I, I was, I was at a, um, I was at like a Sons of Abraham kind of thing, which a Jewish person, a, a Christian person, a Muslim person, and the Jewish man said. Um, you know, I, I am beginning to wonder if what we call God, what I would call ultimate reality, maybe natural, maybe supernatural. I'm beginning to wonder if that's more like a field than a person. And the Christian guys, no, absolutely not. It's a person. And the Muslim guys, no, absolutely not. It's a person. And then the Jewish guy said, I'm beginning to wonder if the impersonal universe has intention. And so, when someone has a mystical experience and they feel comfort, is that the comfort of a blanket because they they are comforted by a connection with something bigger than themselves? Or 
Is it a comfort like a hug that they feel a sense of benevolence and caring and love? I don't know. I don't know. I never will know. And I really don't need to know. I mean, my takeaway is that people that go looking for something bigger than themselves find it. They report it in much the same way. And they really don't editorialize. People that people that have this experience, they they don't come away with very clear theology. They sort of come away with no theology. <laughs> they have experience. They say, I, I don't know about all that. I don't know. Is God a person? I don't know. It I encounter something wonderful, you know. What would you say to someone who hasn't encountered any kind of experience like that? Like I've never, in my Christian experience, I never had what I would consider a personal experience with God in the sense, I mean, I personally believed in him and I personally thought he was there and I was talking with him. Yeah. But where, for example, I had I had an elder in my church say, what is God saying specifically to you, Tim? What is he saying to you? He's not saying to anyone else. And I said, I, I don't even know where to plant that thought. He's not saying anything to me. I have never had that experience. And he's like, what? It's like, I, and he told me, you know, God talks to me personally all the time. I have never had that experience as a Christian. And I've certainly had nothing like it as an atheist. Um, I know that there's, there's ways you can conjure experiences through, you know, substances and so forth. Uh, but, and I know there's people that have used that and have, have found it very healing, but apart from, from something you conjure up through, through medicines and, and substances, um, you know, to me, life is material. Life is, is material pure materialism. Uh, I don't feel like there is anything spiritual. I think spirituality at this point, it feels like it's it's more just uh, an incidental and very fascinating, but incidental accident of the way that our consciousness has evolved, but it could have evolved differently where we never got to this point. And it might evolve back out where we become more robotic in the future, who knows, uh, especially if <laughs> some of the technologies and AI come to go the wrong way. But you know, there, there's no experience I've ever had. And I'm not sure that I, I I'm not avoiding it, but I've never had one. And I feel like if, even if I did have one, I would highly question it. I'd say, is that just chemicals in your brain? Did you just happen to eat the wrong, you know, did, did the, 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 you know, food you ate last night just have something in it that had spoiled. So there's no experience in my, in my life so far. What, like, should I be, do you think people like me should be pursuing experiences or do you think it's, that's just for certain people that have them. And for, for, you know, what about the materialists among us that never had it and don't expect to have it? What should we think about all that? Uh, a couple of things. I think you and I agree that, that we don't have any evidence for anything supernatural. And you have strange things that we can't explain. So when I talk about spirituality, I, it doesn't necessarily imply anything beyond biology and chemistry and physics. It might. I mean, I, my mind is open. Now, Two thirds of the people have, if, if a third of the people have had a mystical experience, peak experience, two thirds of people have not. Now, my wife is a very intuitive person. Um, she has had a mystical experience. She's had several and no one was talking to her. Uh, there was not any kind of relationship. There was nothing erotic. She just sort of felt like she's woven into the fabric of the universe. Um, but she didn't understand it when she had it. Now, I'm reading all about it, and I'm understanding, hey, the people that have these experiences, this is what they experience. But I have never had the experience. I have been persuaded enough by her experience and many others that, that I think it's possible for, us, for a bunch of people to encounter what I would call ultimate reality. I, I don't... I, there's an ongoing discussion in in spiritual circles well is is spirituality an intellectual process or is it an experiential process and I, I would say well it's both or either or, you know if if you have an experience but you don't understand it there's something missing if you understand it like me but you haven't had the experience i would like to have that experience someday but it's not a goal and it's not something i need to do again i'm convinced by the evidence and by the experience that there is a oneness. And and if if you just said to me, I don't believe in the Eastern traditions, throw it out. I don't believe in mysticism, throw it out. Just look at the physics. Let's look at the physics. That's what we're talking about. Hmm. Uh, I, I had a question. I wanted to go to the oneness thing. You know, when I look at some of that stuff, and, and it, I always wonder when, when you read these interesting 
news stories of someone, say, for example, a twin where one twin grows up and moves to New York City, the other one goes to California, one of them has a car accident and the other one immediately feels pain. Uh, you know, that you can't help but wonder, is there some other side to this universe? And it feels like whenever you go down that path with people, it goes quickly too far. You're like, yeah, there's some kind of woo-woo. It's like so, but it's like it feels like we're going too far. But then as soon as you ignore it and say, well, there, but there's nothing, it's just pure materialism, which I honestly kind of land on. It feels like we're kind of ignoring the fact that there that there does feel like there's something. And it's it's a weird dynamic to live in because you feel like don't bring us to the oneness you feel like there's some other purpose to life. But all the suggestions of like, yeah, there is a purpose. It's Jesus, or there is a purpose. It's Allah. Whatever the, the purpose is that we've come up with, that there's something higher going on, those feel quickly at this point like dead ends. But it, it it's a weird place to be. It's a weird place to, to, to wonder and also to think, I, my best guess at this point is there's not a, a damn thing more than this universe than just the atoms. But then you bring in, like you said, the, the, the quantum physics and all that, the interconnectedness and you think well maybe you know in 100 or a thousand years the scientists will be able to explain stuff will say oh wow that's not god but well that's 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 a whole different level of reality yeah no i agree I agree. and you know i um that's really interesting and, and you know I, it's common for me to sort of have this kind of conversation somebody thinks it's woo woo and then all of a sudden they start thinking about their own experience and there was something they didn't quite get but i'm with you i think you can you can really take a leap, you know, to to us to immediately assume, oh, it's, it's something we will never understand. It's something outside biology and chemistry and physics. It's got to be uh, supernatural. Right? The the idea of the soul, for instance, is is Greek. It's not particularly Jewish or Christian. And Aristotle thought that everything had a soul. That plants had souls. That's why they that's why they grew and processed water and nutrients. And he thought that animals had souls. That's why they chased after prey and escaped predators. And and, and then he thought humans had souls, and, and, and that's how they thought. Well, we've explained the way that, you know, there's there's no evidence that a plant has a soul. There's no evidence that an animal has a soul. And I don't have any evidence that I have a soul. I really don't know where that would be, what it would do, how it would transport me anyplace. It's just an example of something that they used. They used to think thunder and lightning was supernatural. Right it's so, fascinating. When I was in New Guinea, that came out with animism. Are you familiar with animism? Yes, yes. And they would tell us, like, if if you wanted to ever go live with the tribal people and, and really understand them, they would. You'd have to ask questions. Once you learn the language, of course, you'd have to ask questions the right way. And so, for example, they said if you were to see a, a guy who's got a field of wheat. And he does have a sickle where he could go harvest the wheat real quickly. But you see him out there with this little paring knife and he's taking like one at a time. So, you know, why are you doing that? And so this is just the way we do it. But but if you reverse it a little bit, what, what happens if you use the big sickle? Oh, no, no. There's a spirit in the field. He will be upset. You know, it will be concerned about what you're doing. So you do it in a way that they can't understand you. And it was fascinating to understand that they think that there's spirits in everything. And I'm not giving that worldview credence by any stretch but just saying it's fascinating the way that it's even i think even in our society we're far more animistic than we give credence to even stuff like where they would do certain rituals to avoid the spirits detecting them or, or being concerned you know we'll say you know knock on wood and that's that's a version of animism if you do that the spirits aren't going to get you you know the bad juju isn't going to come come when you're you know knocking so can you just just describe you touched on the idea of the afterlife where are you with that at this point? Do you think you go somewhere when you die? As I was finishing my book, I encountered a guy in my reading who was a former Catholic priest who's now a Zen master. And he's one of the few people who mm. spends those boundaries. And um, I said, what an interesting guy. I need to meet him. Well, he's in Dallas. He's 20 minutes away from me. So my wife and I went and found him. We have a Zen practice. And when you have a Zen practice, you... Um, the Buddha was asked, you know, where, where do we start? Where do we end? What's the meaning of life? And he just said, it's all speculation. It's all speculation. You want to explore your connection to everyone and everything. And so my approach is very Zen. And there are some Buddhists. Buddhism is, is based on a few things. One is impermanence. that are, the, the only thing that is permanent is change. 
The second is impersonality. That if I say, uh, Tim, who are you? And you start to explain, well, I'm a, I'm a dad, you know, I'm a podcaster. Well, you weren't always that. Who, who are you? You know, if you strip away mine and yours, biology and chemistry and physics, conditioning, experience, random events, what, what, what is Larry Jordan outside of biology and chemistry and physics, conditioning, random events? And how am I fundamentally different than you? Um, I don't think there is a particular self that I could attach to. And and no self, you know, Buddhism says explore your true self, which is no self. Um, <laughs> you know, just recognize that you're part of everything. Um, so there are some Buddhists, and, you know, Buddhism is like Christianity. You know, there's different people who believe different things. I've never in several years of practicing Zen heard anybody talk about heaven or hell or after. There are other Buddhists who, who very much believe in reincarnation. And if you say, well, if you don't have a self, how do you reincarnate? Well, your your essence reincarnates. Oh, gosh, you know, now I have a self and a soul and an essence, and I don't know which is which. And, you know, and, you know, I heard there's a guy named um, J.P. Sears, who's kind of a, he's a humorist, and he kind of pokes fun at, at spiritual people. And he said one day, you know, I uh, I used to believe that there's a personal God that punishes and rewards people. But uh, now I don't believe that. It sounds like Santa Claus. I'm enlightened. Uh, I believe that there's an impersonal universe and we develop karma. And then the impersonal universe decides whether we're going to come up in a better place or a worse place. And of course, he's poking fun at the whole notion that, that reincarnation makes no more sense. In some ways, it makes less sense to me. Just my opinion. I don't want to rile anybody up. Some people feel very strongly about it. But but no, I, I really I think uh I think we get stirred into the soup, just like just like your your bones and your brain get stirred into the soup, into the terrestrial soup, you get stirred into the cosmic soup. Now, energy is never destroyed, so so is my energy out there somewhere, uh maybe. Does it identify as Larry Jordan? I don't know how it could. Um, I have no memories of past lives. I have no expectation that I get another chance at any of this. Um, so, so I, I, I th now if somebody said to me, "Well, if Larry Jordan's still out there, maybe the wave merges into the ocean. Maybe what used to be Larry Jordan's floating around in the ocean. He just doesn't know he's Larry Jordan." He never comes back holy as anything. But I guess in a way that means you live forever. I, go, I guess, you know. But again, <laughs> if if Larry Jordan doesn't even know he's Larry Jordan, I and, and you know, people say, Well, don't you want to live forever? I said, Listen, I've been Larry Jordan for 65 years. It's pretty cool, but it's not all that. Do I want to be Larry Jordan forever? Probably not. <laughs> you know, probably not. Well, in terms of not the uh, part of who you would be if there were an afterlife, but just the experience of an eternal bliss, an actual place, an actual experience of bliss where things are restored. Did, did you feel like whatever part of that you had heard about as a kid and expected to see, you know, uncle so-and-so again, who'd passed, you know, expect to see them in heaven and grandparents all of a sudden, maybe I don't see them someday. Maybe they're just gone. Um, did any of that, or just the pure selfish experience of like, I just want, I want to be in glory. I want to feel no pain. I want to shine. I want to see the heaven with all of its gemstones. I want to see Jesus, of course. Uh, I want to be and see the throne and the angels. Did any of that feel like a big loss to you as you worked through this book and worked through your worldview shift that, that you weren't going to probably see some or all that? At first. Um, and I say in the book, I don't think I'm going to see grandma. You know, I, I say that. And that's distressing to people. And the idea that there may not be an afterlife, there may not be a personal God, we might not be able to have a relationship with God. There's a lot of things in the book that are potentially distressing to people. Now, the book is a pretty gentle book, and it leaves plenty of room, uh, you know, for different ideas. Now, I do want to say that my personality was transformed, my spirituality was transformed, my politics were transformed, and so I just look at things in a different way. And I have 
awe of this place that we are. And I have gratitude for, for being able to be here. And I have reverence, whether this is all a product of design or evolution, it's it's incredible. And I have a sense of responsibility. I feel like I got one life. I've got one opportunity to be connected. You know, I, I don't get a second chance. So in some ways, life is more precious to me. And I think there's there's more and more people who are thinking, yeah, the heaven is a place and you're going to go there forever. That's not really that's not really the way it works. In the Eastern traditions, there's what the Hindus call Brahman, everything, what the Buddhists call void, emptiness. And it's really, you know, it's lack of separation and it's outside of space and time. So if somebody says, well, eternity doesn't mean, you know, forever, it doesn't mean a real, real long time. It just means out of space and time. You're just out of the material realm. In, in the process of doing all this, you know, I, I got some strange looks from people and I and I've had people tell me things like, well, you're not a Christian. I, I don't like the labels. You know, I don't know. What, what does it mean to be a Christian? While I was pitching the book, I had an editor say, is this a Christian book? I said, well, you know, half of it is deconstructing the, the Christian worldview and, and, you know, talks a lot about Jesus. So I don't know. Is it a Christian book? She says, does it bring people to Jesus? I said, no, it's not a Christian. It doesn't chase people away from Jesus. It's a very respectful view of Jesus, but it's a different perspective than most people get. But but anyway, I've, I've, I've been kind of beaten up by some people, so so I don't beat anybody up. And I, I have dismantled so much doctrine that the last thing I was going to do is say, no, no, everybody's got it all wrong, everybody's got it all wrong. Larry Jordan's going to tell you the way it really is. Larry Jordan, nobody can do that. Larry Jordan can't do that. Nobody's supposed to do that. And part of, I think, the problem that Christianity's in now is they've doubled down so many times. You know, there, there might have been an opportunity in, in the 1500s when Luther was to say, you know, we really need to dig a little deeper. We need to explore some of these things that are in human inventions, the Trinity and original sin, substitutionary tone. We need to we need to look at those things, but but they didn't. You know, they doubled down. So at this point, if you've insisted for 2,000 years it's this way, it's the only way, you really can't say, oh, I might have been wrong about that. Because the next thing is somebody said, well, what else were you wrong about? So I, I'm pretty tolerant. And again, I don't hold many beliefs strongly except for the oneness. Now, I had an interesting experience. I had a good friend visit me in Crestone, Colorado, uh, where we spent two months out of the year every year for six years. They have a bunch of spiritual centers there, and that's where I've you know, chanted the Shiva and World of Dervishes and stuff like this. And um, he said, tell me about your book. And I got about three sentences into it. He said, no, it doesn't work for me. And he's a he's a smart guy. And he said, uh, I think the earth was created 6,000 years ago. I think everybody but Noah and his family was wiped out by a flood. And that, that includes the dinosaurs who were walking around with Noah. He just didn't let him on the on the ark. And I said, man, oh man. I said, this is just me. Again, I'm very respectful. Um, we're at 8,000 feet above sea level. I mean, did the water really get to 8,000 feet above sea level? And where did all that water come from? And where did it all go? And how did all the kangaroos swim from Australia to the Middle East, take a boat ride, and swim back without leaving any evidence anyplace else? And why don't we find dinosaur bones and human bones in the same place? I mean, I just don't get it. And then I said, but you might be right. I mean, I wasn't here uh, 6,000 years ago. I wasn't here 13 billion years ago. I've already told you, I, I don't believe what you said, but you might be right. And, um, you know, you got to go, oh, yeah. And then I said, now it's your turn. He said, what do you mean? Well, I was gracious enough to tell you you might be right. Now, why don't you tell me I might be right? I can't do that. And I said, well, I love you. I, I'm i not angry. I'm, I'm, you know, I get it. But surely you can understand that when I say you might be right, and you can't say it, that, that that really seems arrogant and dismissive to me. And he said, well, I know it does, but that's just the way it has to be. So we went up on the mountain. And he had some kind of experience. And I asked him about it later. And he said, well, 
it, it wasn't erotic. It wasn't woo-woo. It wasn't supernatural. He just had this sense that, man, I'm up here on the mountain. Look at all this beauty in front of me. And this is just one small piece of one immense universe. But, you know, he had a, and a lot of people have experiences in nature where they feel the sense of awe and wonder and connection and gratitude. And so we're down in the valley looking up at the mountain the next day. And he said, you know that conversation we had the other day? I said, yeah. He said, you might be right. And to me, more conversations are supposed to end that way. You know, I... If somebody says, I just know there's a God, I say, well, you don't know there's a God. And if somebody says, I just know there's not a God, well, you don't know there's not a God. And, you know, we ought to all be able to say to each other, you might be right. Because we might and they might. And it's really part of my, and people have, um, I said that in an author talk, and um, six months later, the person, this woman comes up and just puts both arms around and says, oh, my gosh. I think about you every day. I've been married 42 years. My wife's standing there. I'm thinking, what is this? And she says, you might be right. She said, it's life changing. It is life changing. Mm -hmm. Say that so often. And, you know, part of the book is to say to people, hey, you know, just like in the first half, I kind of shook some things and held them up to the light and they didn't really pass muster. And at the end of the book, you know, I sort of proposed some things more in the form of reporting, you know, Somebody has described this as like, this is like spirituality 101. It's like a survey course, you know? Uh, this is what people in spiritual circles are talking about today. Um, but, you know, don't take any, it's like the boot on his deathbed. I think this is, this is just uh, a fable. But the boot on his deathbed was supposed to have said, don't believe anybody, even me, you know, hold it up to the light. Um, and, and and I'm very much, again, I'm very much in a, in a Zen frame of mind. I didn't get recruited to Zen. I didn't go looking for it. I sort of stumbled into it. But after looking for 20 years and really concluding, I've gone as far as I can go. I just don't know if there's anybody who thinks the way I do. The Zen Buddhists uh, kind of think the way that I do. Hmm. Help me. Yeah, go ahead. I was just going to say the one thing I I would just want to clarify from my side because i do use the word atheist as you know i think the the best in my opinion uh, the, the humblest and most accurate atheists are going to say when i say atheism i'm not saying there are no gods but i am saying that i don't see evidence for it and so to say to someone for example who's a six-day creationist and believes in a inerrant literal word of god to say yes technically anything could be right we we could all be mm -hmm. this whole universe could be uh, a, a drop in somebody's watering can we could this whole universe and maybe multi multiverses could all be a drop in somebody's watering can in this universe the bigger universe is much bigger than we think and all we all of our experiences for billions and trillions of years we're all a drop in somebody's watering can somewhere um yes technically any of it could be true technically yahweh could be true uh could be real but to say at the same time, I, yes, I have the humility to say that that's true. To say what what's the evidence leading towards, and so and I don't mean that we would want to ram that down someone's throat and say to a six day creationist, uh, you know, you're you're an absolute idiot, even though you know we might be thinking that in the back of our minds. You know, to to, to season our conversations with grace for sure, just like we would have wanted to do as Christians to continue that and say, you know, at the end of the day, my goal is not to offend. It's not to make you look bad. It's to say simply in, in the most humble, gracious sense, where's the evidence leading? And I, I think it arguably is leading away from the six-day creationism, creationism, as I'm sure you would too. But to say, we don't ultimately know. We don't know. There, there are things about this universe that are beyond uh, what we can understand right now. But I think in that to say to people, you can't just keep on making mythology up, and this is my word for it, but you can't make mythology up and then impose it on people and and say this might be right but there's no real evidence for it especially when there's evidence that it evolved from other earlier mythologies and so there, there is a bit of a fight in me if you want to put it that way you know a fight in me to say let's have the humility but let's also admit what just doesn't make any sense because there's some stuff out there 
in, in my opinion, even any version of Christianity, it just doesn't make sense. And especially when you're adding into it with so many tr tr uh, traditions of Christianity, this whole threat thing of like, you believe what I believe or else. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm, I often bring into it the discussion about how this is often not just an issue, a, ta a discussion among adults, but it, this is ending up being psychological child abuse when you impose this stuff on kids and say, uh, if you don't believe like me, if you don't believe the blood of Jesus Christ is the only way to be saved and to be uh, covered from your sin, then you, you, you truly will be in hell, a burning hell. You're psychologically abusing children. Now I've got a problem. And so I think there's, there's a balance there of, of, you know, letting all the, the conversations into the discussion. But for example, I've used this before, and this is going to be a bit of an extreme, but if someone's, if someone were to say, like, I'm taking this a to total different direction, but I think you'll see the connection. If someone were to say, you got married, two Christians got married, and one of you says, oh, I, I, I changed my mind. I don't think this is correct anymore. Did you violate your, your kind of implied vows? You both married with the understanding or implication. We're going to follow Jesus Christ till the day we die. We're going to raise kids as little soldiers for Jesus. We're going to love him. And you say, well, is did you kind of violate your vow by now? You're saying, I don't actually believe this stuff. So, um, you know, we we married in a church. We we talked about God in the wedding and the in the vows, and now you're not even doing that. Did you violate your covenant? And I use the illustration in the parallel. Let's say that two white supremacists get married, and they're both, you know, all the all the the whole nine yards, and then want to, and then you start having kids, and you're gonna you intend to raise them that way. And then one of you wakes up and says, wow, like this is toxic beyond toxic. This is crazy. We cannot raise our kids this way. Are, are you, is that a violation of your, your marriage vows? Is, is it, have, have you just been basically abandoning your spouse and your, your family by making this choice? And you say, well, no, you're, you're making the healthiest choice you could to abandon these beliefs. There's no evidence for it being good. There's a lot of evidence for it being extremely toxic. And even though that's very different from Christianity in some ways, not all, um, I think there's a point at which we have to say, let's let's step back and say, not not all these ideas are equal. You can't say, well, you've got a, 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 a you've got a, a marriage where you don't have white supremacy at all. You oppose it, and you do. They're both equal discussions. You might be right. I might be right. No, no, white supremacy is not right. Period. Well, conservative evangelical fundamentalist Christianity might be right, technically, but I'm not going to allow. I'm not going to give it a platform in the same way. Does that? Does that resonate at all with, with you? Yeah, yeah. Uh, two things. The book starts out in 9-11. It ends 11-9. You say, what's 11-9? That's the day that Trump got elected. It just happened to bookend when I was writing. And somebody tells somebody says to me, well, you, you sound a little squishy. Uh, you know, you don't have any beliefs. You think everybody might be right. Don't you have any absolutes? I say, I told you, I have one absolute. Everyone's related, everyone's connected. Now, if everyone's related, would I uh, ban Muslims? Would I build walls? Would I separate families? Would I marginalize LGBTQ people? You know, would I do any of those things? No. I wouldn't do it to my son. I wouldn't do it to my brother. I wouldn't do it. Now, again, if you didn't read the book, or you read the book and didn't agree with it, and you say, well, look, I'm just I'm just here in my own life with my own family. You know, I vote certain ways because it's better for me. And I've had people tell me I don't give a shit about anybody else. Okay, I, but, but we're not going to agree on that. So so I I think, you know, the, the ultimate litmus test is, is, is that how you would behave if you realized you were in, woven into the fabric of the universe? If you realize that what hurts me hurts you, would would that produce the most benefit for the most people or not? Mm. And I, you know, I broke a vow. I was going to raise my children Catholic. I suppose I did that for most of the time, but you know, it it just it couldn't work for me. So, so yeah, I I I, I totally agree with you. And the other thing I was going to say, and as soon as you start talking, it it was almost uh, serendipitous. I have a a blog on um, Pathios, and they have channels for all kinds of religions. They have channels for atheists. I'm not in the atheist channel. I'm not in the Christian channel. I'm not in the progressive Christian channel. I'm like more more ideas or new voices, you know, 
because I'm sort of trying to span and I'm trying not, you know, do I identify as an atheist? I mean, I identify as an atheist the way you just said, that I, this is what I think based on the evidence, but of course I don't know. There's other people that might say, well, you don't sound like an atheist. You know, one thing that's, Christianity's become a dirty word and atheism has become a dirty word, and I don't really like either one of them. And I don't really feel like I should need to vote. But what I, where I was going with this is, I just posted on, on Patheos, why do we believe what we believe? And I basically said, you know, we believe a lot of things because they're comfortable, not because they're sensible. We believe there's a God because otherwise I'm, I'm here all by myself. Nobody loves me. I, I believe that there are rules uh, that God laid down. Otherwise, you know, it'd be a free for all. Uh, I believe that we get judged and we either get punished or rewarded. Otherwise, the universe would be unfair. I believe I have a soul and I'm going to go someplace. Otherwise, what, you only get me 60 years, you know, um, and I believe I have free will. Otherwise, I'm just like an animal or a robot. Well, I say in the article, there is no evidence for any of those things. And billions, literally billions of people have lived lives, very meaningful lives, very compassionate and wise lives, lives where they think this is their only shot and they're happy. Now, I also say the evidence doesn't dispute it either. I could not tell you. I looked into this. I know the answer. There is no God. There are no rules. There is no punishment. There is no free will. I, I, the evidence is, can land you either way. But the reason it's important to me is people have said to me, I believe these things because it would just be unimaginable to live in a world without. And, you know, if I didn't know, for instance, that I was going to see grandma, I just assume, I just assume not know that I'm wrong. And I said, you know, the world without any of these things, what does a universe look like without a God, without rules, without punishment or reward, without a soul, without free will? It looks exactly like this universe. What I'm talking about is when I say ultimate reality, you're supposed to think this is a guy that wants to know what is, not what he wants to hear. He's there's no sacred cows. There's no question that's off the table. He's going to be respectful the way he encounters everybody. He's not going to proselytize or evangelize. But it, this guy's driven by experience and evidence. And, mm. and that's all we can do. We all have beliefs. The idea of raising kids in a certain worldview and then shifting as an adult, even a slow shift, uh, has to be you know producing some very interesting conversations. Have they remained in Catholicism or have they kind of gone on this journey with you at all? Like, how's it gone? I was working all the time. So my wife raised her kids. And I say that I was I was at plenty of gymnastics meets and band concerts and stuff. But I'm not taking credit for my kids. I'm just saying my kids are smarter than I was. They ask more questions. They're more gracious. Um, and they naturally came to a lot of conclusions that that I didn't get to until later. And they helped me get there. So and they're adults. So, you know, if I if I did a course correction when my kids were, you know, 10 instead of 30. Uh, yeah, it's, it's it's challenging. It raises all kinds of questions. But as adults, they're they're already they're already there. And my wife, like I say, is is intuitive. And just because I'm sort of analytical and I was a banker and, and I'm practical, you know, I I'm I think about I think about these things long and hard. I read a thousand books. I, I go looking for all these experiences. And you can imagine I've got a pile of books on my desk and I read something and all of a sudden it's like the light bulb goes off and I slam the book shut and I tell my wife, Oh my gosh, you're not gonna believe this. And I, I go in this long discussion of, of what the guy said, and she says, um, I've kind of always 
thought about things that way. I mean, she's very, she, she got there the short, my kids and my wife got there the short way. I'm the guy that got there the long way. My journey was much longer, much more arduous than, you know, than many people I know just because of my personality. Mm, that's interesting. But I did want to uh, just kind of ask at this point, it's, it's, it sounds like it's been a crazy journey. Uh, where do you go from here? Like what's, what's the, the rest of your life in terms of, you know, Christians would obviously say you've given up your purpose to, uh, to know the Jesus and to know the gospel and share the gospel. But it feels like in some ways, what you've done is more, you've taken a lot of the, the chaos off the table. You've cleaned up, you've got a, you know, hopefully a, a bit of a fresh slate here. Now that it is clean from some of the garbage and some of the just chaos of it all, the details, what do you feel like you want to do with the rest of your life? You know, so let's assume you live a very long life. Hopefully both of us do. What what are the next few decades going to look like for you? And what is your, where, where's your passion driving you? I know that you, you said it's, you've, you've already done a lot. It's time to, you know, you're retired and so forth. But in terms of when you are connecting with the community and when you are looking outward to how you can leave this planet better than you found it. What are the passions on your heart to leave, you know, to leave for the next generation besides what you've done so far? Yeah, I went on a retreat early, early on in my journey, sort of looking for the answer of, you know, what's my what's my big purpose in life? And um, I came away with, you know, there was no voice. There was there was just a realization. Just, just live your small life. So so people ask me sometimes, what's your goal? I mean, I'm a retired guy. You know, I achieved everything I ever wanted to achieve. I've traveled everywhere I want to travel. I don't really have a goal. I have very small goals at this point. Now, I have an unbelievably rich life. When I meet people who are on spiritual journeys, I ask I ask them three questions. I say, are you still angry? And no one has ever said to me, why would I be angry? <laughs> We've all either said, you know, you bet I'm angry. Or they say, well, I used to be angry, but I'm not anymore. Uh, I also ask them, "What now that you've left church, what is your community? And they say, I don't have a community. And I say, what is your spiritual practice? And they say, I don't have a spiritual practice. So I'm living my small life. I, I play with my grandkids all the time. My wife and I are as close as two people can be. I have friends that I see... Sundays and Tuesdays and Thursdays and Fridays and Saturdays. I ha I have volunteer stuff that I'm doing. My community and my spiritual practice, um, I feel like I have a passport. I feel like I, I can walk into an ashram and be comfortable. I can walk into a Zendo and be comfortable. I can walk into a Methodist church and be comfortable. So if somebody says, you want to go to Bible study with me? I'm interested in the Bible. I'll go to Bible study. Uh, do you want to be in a unity book club? Yeah, I do want to be in a, I'm a book guy. Uh, would you like to speak at the Unitarian Universalists? Absolutely. You know, I, I have something to say and they're interested in listening to it. Do, do I want to Zoom with some progressive Christians who are asking some of the same questions that you are? Of course. You know, I go to Crestone, you will find me at the Ashram, you will find me at the Zendo, you will find me at the Shinto Center. You might find me in a sweat lodge. Those are all different expressions of people trying to figure out how they're woven into the fabric. And I'm, I'm open-hearted and open-minded. So I hope that I'm living the kind of life where, where nobody says, well, don't ask these kind of questions. You'll end up like Larry Jordan. I hope people are saying, and they are. Look at Larry Jordan. <laughs> You know, he ripped his life. He ripped his life apart. He, he turned himself inside out, and he's better. He's happier. He's he's a joyful guy. He's living a life of service. He has community. He has spiritual practice. He has connection. And and you know, I was worried when I wrote the book because I don't have credential. I'm a I'm a banker, and I wrote a book about spirituality. And I thought I don't know if anybody's going to take this seriously. I'm afraid that people are going to come out of the woodwork and say, well, you did some homework, but you didn't do enough because, you know, you obviously don't know this or that or the other. The book has been taken really seriously. And I mean, rabbis and ministers and Zen masters have looked at it. Nobody said, man, you got that screwed up. You know, it's led to a lot of conversations like this. Tim, there's nothing I like more than having 
conversations like this about politics and religion and the Eastern and Western worldviews and self and soul and free will. I mean, what what an enriching experience this all is. So mm. it's amazing too to me the just the reality. I think you you, you may have said the word peace, or at least it it seemed like it uh, came across my mind that the peace that we're often looking for in life, we, we do hear the promise of it in Christianity, you know, the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and mind. But at the end of the day, a lot of us end up finding a lot more peace on the other side of deconversion, or at least heavy deconstruction. And, you know, even Jesus talks about the idea that you'll, you'll know the, tr the, the tree by its fruits. You'll know the outcome of what, you know, what is, what is going on here by what happens, you know, at, at the end of it. And people say, oh, your deconstruction is so destructive. But at the end of it, I do feel like the truth did set me free. I do feel like I've got more peace than ever. And I tell people I had more peace in the first few minutes, in the first hour after deconversion, which for me happened four years ago, four and a half years ago. But I had more peace in the first hour than I had in 40 plus years as a Christian. Like that has to account for something. And of course, Christians would explain it away. Yeah, you have peace because now you don't think you're accountable. You can just sin send your whole life away and you don't think you're ever going to get in trouble for it with God. You know, that's, that's a fake piece. So I know they have their, their, their explanations, but you know, I'm honest about, about it. I, I wasn't trying to sin. I did not intend to deconvert. I did not want to. I was in many ways. Uh, and I'm, I remember the CS Lewis story where CS Lewis was an atheist and he says he went kicking and screaming into the kingdom where he did not want to become a Christian and admit that Jesus was, was God and that the gospel was true. And, and yet he was, he, he felt like he couldn't, deny it when he went kicking and screaming into the kingdom. I went kicking and screaming out of the kingdom. I was like, no, I don't want to let go of this. Um, I was not trying to sin, but I did have more peace when I, when I deconverted. And it's, it's just so fascinating to me that reality for so many of us, that is a common trope now that people are saying over and over, I left Christianity and suddenly the world made exponential more sense and my life got put into focus. And yeah, I was a little bit angry, but at the end of the day, that was just part of, I felt I was too vulnerable. I was too susceptible to false ideas. I was angry because of the loss. I was grieving that what I was promised that was never actually real. The anger, it was a, a, a good phase to go through. But once you get past it, you're like, you know what? It is what it is. Past generations were maybe arguably doing the best they could at the time. They didn't know a lot about the mythology. They didn't have all the comparative mythology classes that we can get to in a heartbeat now. Uh, they didn't have the internet. So it's like they did the best that they could. It is what it is, but I'm here now. And what, what can I do from, from this point on? This is my new starting point. Right now I can heal from what's happened and I can be at peace. And instead of trying to just splatter, as it were, the bullets of my anger of, of like, you, you all are so bad to just say, I'm, I'm going to create peace. I'm going to create love. I'm going to create joy. I'm going to just love on you all. And we're going to have conversations, but at the end of it, I want to do what you say, you know, you might be right. And either way, I love you. I love you. I care about you. I care about your well-being. I'm not going to threaten you with my worldview, and I hope you won't threaten me with yours. And that to me is such a beautiful thing, especially to pass on to kids. And it, it what it does, I think, in a lot of ways is it, it it implies or directly states that you're all you have an autonomy. You're allowed to pick what you think is best for you. And I know Christians think that's horrible, but uh, a lot of them do. But you know, you're allowed to pick what's best for you. And if the path, like I've told my kids even, and they know they know I'm an atheist. Uh, they're very familiar with what I believe and don't believe. But I've said to them, look, if you end up being a Christian, that is completely fine. We'll have some very serious conversations about why you got convinced that it's real and not mythology. But I said, you know, you don't have to believe like daddy or mama or anybody. You get to choose. And I often will say to them, um, we'll do this fun little thing where I'll say, imagine you have like a bubble around your head. And we'll call it your worldview bubble. And I'll say, I want to, or like a helmet. Not like I'm going to pop it, but just I just, I just want to get into your worldview. And this helmet's protecting you. And I say, I want to get inside of that worldview helmet, that bubble. And I've said, you, you kids, please, you know, pretend with me, push me away. I say, no. And I'll say, if someone else says it, you need to believe like me. No, I don't. And we'll just practice it over and over. You don't, you don't have to believe like anybody, including daddy. And I think giving the kids that, that freedom to say, this is your journey. Think about it long and do what's best for you. And what brings you peace and joy? What a beautiful gift to give to people. And I think that that's happening in different ways all over these conversations. Um, it's interesting. You know, not only is my life better, I had a, I, I've been writing about, you know, where do you find community? Where do you find spiritual practice? And one of my friends said, I've really never had a spiritual practice. And it was the first time it occurred to me, but I said, I really never had a spiritual practice until I left church. 
I mean, <laughs> you know, if I had to de define my spirituality, it's non-religious or non-theistic spirituality. And again, it's not necessarily supernatural, but it's been so, so enriching. And I, I, I bristle too when people, people equate Christian lives with moral lives as if non-Christian lives are immoral. And, you know, I try to put my hand up when I, when I hear that. I mean, I've, I've looked at all kinds of religions. There's not a one of them that says, yeah, we think you're supposed to kill people and lie and steal and sleep with everyone's wives. Nobody says that. Um, and, you know, I've also read where, you know, the Ten Commandments, they look a whole lot like the moral codes that everyone else at the time was drawing up for themselves. I mean, um, and, and if I were to, quote, live by the Ten Commandments, it'd be more difficult than living by, you know, my one-line creed. You know, you're not supposed to steal. Um, are you supposed to steal uh, to feed your family? You're not supposed to kill. Are you supposed to kill to defend yourself? You know, it's the Ten Commandments answer all the easy questions, not the hard questions. And, you know, everyone's related and everyone's connected. That, that'll that'll get you the right answer to just about any question in my experience. Mm. I love, too, how so many of us are finding that the spirituality that we're pursuing, if we want to call it that, is often related to just getting connected to, number one, to ourselves. Yeah, mm -hmm. but also getting connected to the planet. I, I love that uh, that uh, song by Marin Morris, My Church. I'm just going to read a couple of the words. You probably have heard this. Uh, she says, uh, can I get a hallelujah? Can I get an amen? Feels like the Holy Ghost running through you when I play the highway FM. I find my soul revival singing every single verse. Yeah, I guess that's my church. Like just riding down the highway, listening to some fun songs. And I have an aunt who lives out in uh, Boulder, Colorado. And she talks about like walking her dogs up on the mountain like that's her spiritual experience and i'm, I'm very big into i uh, love john denver his music and that, that for me was a very spiritual experience too I, his his stuff really digs home and you know you you get uh, i remember that verse um rocky mountain high starts mm -hmm. with he was born in the summer of his 27th year i mean i think about that a lot that that phrase gets me uh, it, i mean literally just feels like it's a, a beautiful knife in the heart as it were of healing uh, he was born in the summer of his 27th year coming home to a place he'd never been before. He left yesterday behind him. You might say you might say he was born again. You might say he found a key for every door. And that just, it blows my mind, that, that idea. And of course, John Denver wasn't looking at conservative Christianity and fundamentalism. He was just talking about, in many ways, nature. And of course, you know, Colorado, Rocky Mountain High and all that stuff. But the connection that we have to this planet, the universe, the oneness I think you're referring to, you, you connect to yourself, you heal yourself, you get to a point of, I don't have an agenda. I don't have to push on anybody. I don't have to be someone I'm not. I can just learn to accept myself, love myself first. And then in some ways, when you do that and you start to connect to the planet around you and just, you get grounded in yourself, you eventually get to a point where you feel like, I hate to use the word self-actualization. I know there's a lot of people that would gris bristle at that word, but um, just, you, get, you just get the sense that like you're coming home. Just like John Denver said, you're, you're coming home to a place you've never been before. And it feels so weird at first, but then you, when you get to a point of healing, you're like, okay, this this feels more like home than Jesus ever did. And I'm, I'm in more ways disconnected from the absolutes of life than ever. And I'm absolutely fine. And I feel so happy, you know? I, I, yeah, I completely agree. <laughs> I think that's well said. I think that's well said. Hmm. Well, I, I did want to just make sure we um, gave a final... Uh, plug, of course, for the book and your website, as well as your blog. I appreciate you mentioning that in the interview. Um, I'll have the link for all three beneath this this interview. So please, for anyone that can, please go like and subscribe and check it all out and everything. Um, but before we wrap up, did you have anything we didn't touch on that you wanted to bring to our, to our thinking? Or any final thoughts? Um, a few things popped up. Um, you mentioned psychedelics at one point. And um, that's another thing about the peak experience. People with psychedelics have peak experiences. People with seizures and strokes have peak experiences. Um, you know, people in meditation and prayer have peak experiences. People have random peak experiences in nature. Again, being a banker and a practical guy and somebody that wants the simplest answer, you know, if it'll work, um, I think all those things are referring to things that cause us to drop our filters. Um, there's a um, 
there's a TED talk by Jill Bolt Taylor, who's a neuroscientist who experienced a stroke. She had a stroke in the left side of her brain, which is the part that organizes. And so all the sudden she recorded it because, you know, after she recovered, she was able to recall. And she said, you know, I wasn't able to organize things. I just saw a field. I felt this benevolence. I didn't know where my hand ended and, you know, where, where the rest of the world began. Again, I keep saying I'm not sure if it's natural or supernatural. Jill, Jill Voltaire never said that um, that she that anything supernatural happened to her. She basically suggested that when part of her brain was quieted, that that she saw another view of what's always here. You know, mm -hmm. and I think that was really powerful. Um, we taught you. You just mentioned uh, self actualization, and um, Maslow is one of my favorites. Maslow, after he talked about self-actualization, most people think he stopped there. Most people think that that's the peak of the pyramid. And he said, no, after you actualize yourself, you transcend. He wrote a book called The Farther Reaches of Humanity or something like that, where he said you transcend. And transcenders are people who are joyful, who are connected, you know, who, who are not holding on to a narrow sense of, of who or what they are. And he also talked about peak experiences. And in one of my recent blogs, I quoted him as saying, and this is what I've been saying, um, and what, what they said in the Tao of Physics. We have religion over here. We have mystics. We have science over here. We have quantum physicists. In a lot of ways, they're saying the same thing, that, that religion and science, well, let me say spirituality and science, because religion brings in all the doctrine and all of the presuppositions about the way the universe is that may or may not be true. But, you know, people who go seeking to touch ultimate reality and people go exploring the physical universe, they they end up kind of bumping into each other on the road. Fascinating stuff. Well, I'm looking forward to uh, whatever your next book is. I don't know if there's a book on the radar for you, but uh, I think it's going to be really interesting to see how this evolves. So I would love to kind of, you know, leave a kind of a, a back of your mind invitation to come back whenever the next, uh, you know, passion is on your heart or the next book comes out or whatever. Um, I'd love to see how this story evolves because in some ways that's, that's in many ways, what's, what's happening here is we are uh, not the physical evolution of our pl planet and species and so forth, but just we're evolving our thinking. And just like you could, I mean, you really look at Christianity's evolution, it really did evolve. Like there really were like earlier versions of Christianity and it they were fighting and people haggling over what doctrines were true and which weren't and how to reinterpret things. People with swords often won the day and said that, no, this is how it's going to be. And that's how it was. And that's what we have inherited. But, you know, it's still an evolution of sorts. And in many ways that, that, that journey is not stopping. We're still learning things, both in terms of science, obviously it's amazing, an amazing time to be in with all the things that are happening. Of course. Um, but we're, we're evolving our thinking. We're evolving our communities. People are bringing better and better topics to the table. And as long as we bring the humility that you've referenced, uh, I think we're we're in for an interesting ride, and hopefully a, a ride where when when we get to the end of our time, if we could, if we're sane enough to to really reflect on our lives, we can say it's been a good life, and I'm definitely leaving this planet better than I found it. And if I had to do it all over again, I'd make some choices. But you know what? I, I did. I created a lot of beauty, a lot of love, a lot of healthiness. I'm proud of my time here. I'm proud of what I what I did. You mentioned early Christianity, and I always tell people. Uh... You know, they say, well, we, you know, we we uh, we want to recover, you know, the early Christianity. I said, I, I do, too. Let's go. Uh, first of all, it's Jewish. Um, Peter is not the head like Catholics say. Paul is not the head like Protestants say. James is the head. James is the brother of Jesus. James uh, was the head of the Jerusalem community for 30 years. He worshipped in the Jewish temple. There was no clergy. There was no Bible. There was no doctrine. Based on, you know, what I know about the early Jewish Christians, there was no notion that Jesus was uh, divine. He, they did believe that he was Messiah, uh, which is, in the Jewish tradition, is a human role. It's not divine at all. So, so I said, if you, if you want to go back to that Christianity, let's go, because I think, I think there's real value there. And nobody wants to go back to that. <laughs> 
nobody wants to go back to it. Mm. And we talk about the journey and how it evolves. You know, people sometimes say to me, well, we're, you know, like, like you almost did, well, where are you going next? And it's like, well, the people that study like the, the spiritual life say, well, it starts out and you, want, you believe the mythology then you start to absorb doctrine. Then maybe you have more of a meta metaphorical view of it. Then you, you know, there's a, there's a gradual loosening until at the end, you're like very oriented towards mysticism and oneness. So not to say that I'm a finished product, nobody is a finished product, but it is to say I'm kind of running out of runway. Um, you know, if you, if, if your thing is, well, everything's, you know, everyone's related and everyone's connected. There's, there's no place else to go and there doesn't need to be in my mind, but, hmm. but it is, it is a thing. It's, it's like, you know, there, there was, there are people that say, we know a lot of, a lot of Western religions are sort of stuck at an early phase where, you know, they believe the mythology and they believe uh, the doctrine. Um, but people who, you know, who sort of keep asking questions, you know, get to a different place. And that's, that's the journey that I think I've, I've, I hope I've been, you know, asking the right questions. Hmm. I love it. I love it. I was going to add one more thing and then we'll uh, wrap up if I could. I, I think even though we touched on how the, the universe isn't necessarily benevolent, it is sort of, you know, it doesn't really care about our, our, our love. It doesn't really care about our, our wholeness and so forth in our journey. It's interesting how our, our consciousness has evolved and arguably has evolved well to say that love and benevolence are important. Even if the universe isn't benevolent, we can be. And I've been trying, I've got little kids. And of course, that's, that's usually the biggest issue of the day is how to love each other. And, but I've been, I, I write a lot of songs for the kids and I'm working on one and I, I won't sing the whole thing because I don't have the words together fully, but I've got this, this, the, the kind of the, oh, yeah. what do you call it? The chorus. And, okay. and, and it's, it's a, this is kind of the, the wrap, wrap up sentence of it. And I, I've, told him like this i'll give you the whole song later but this is the way it's going to end and i have him sing this and it simply goes the rule of our family is the rule of love and that's the way it ends and they're, they're getting that sense but i love i'm not connecting of course to god i'm not connecting it to the afterlife or to hell but i'm saying we, we have a way to choose to live our life as even as little kids we, you can choose to bash them over the head when they take your toy or not and we're going to be a family that chooses love and I, I just think it's such a cool thing that even though benevolence is not woven necessarily into the DNA of the universe, it seems to be the way that our emotional psychological DNA is evolving, that the best people on the planet, in my opinion, are the people that are benevolent and loving. And to say, what can we do to, to further that discussion? And just to give the next generation a sense of saying, when you look at even on the biggest scales, like the wars and the politics and the immigration, like what? What does the rule of love mean in this situation? What does the rule of love mean in the in the the wars that we're seeing going on? What does it mean in the immigration discussion? What does the rule of love mean to us? And, and how can we become the best version of ourselves? And hopefully, some of those discussions that we're all already in, hopefully, they just eventually trickle up to the highest levels of government, and we eventually become truly a place where this planet is is safer for everybody, not just for the you know a few people, but. I just got to start somewhere and hopefully the next generation will do a better job than we did. <laughs> I love that. I think that's great. Thank you. Well, i uh, just wrap up again by saying we've been speaking with Larry Jordan. Uh, please, again, check out his website, his book and everything. And Larry, thanks so much. Great to get to know you. Great to hear your story. Look forward to doing it again sometime. Really appreciate it, Jordan. Thank you so much. Thanks, Larry. Have a great day. <laughs>